I'm your, your host. Um, I'm joined with Jacob Small today. He's going to be talking extending Dynamo. Um, let's, let's do some introductions. So again, Sean Hurley. I'm the engagement manager for Autodesk Community. I'm a long time, I guess you could call a fixture at Autodesk. I've been here 24 years and before that a customer a geeky technologist, and I'm based somewhere in Oregon because I'm in the middle of moving. So I'm moving to Bend, Oregon. I'll be there next month, and I can't wait to be in one place and not living out of boxes and bags. I don't know where anything <laughs> is. It's always that one extra cable that I need to plug in and charge something that is never where I need. I actually had to go get my paddles, and I had to drive from Walla Walla, Washington, to Portland, Oregon to find them. So anyway, Whoa. on to you, Jacob. Yeah, so uh, I'm Jacob Small. I'm a designated support specialist uh, focusing on generative design and BIM, which means I help uh, customers and uh, enterprise business agreements adopt Dynamo, Revit, BIM 360 design, and other applications in sort of our vertical construction space. I've uh, been with Autodesk uh, three and a half years now, uh, based out of Boston, um, pretty much always based out of Boston. Um, but you might catch me uh, every once in a while broadcasting from Sweden, uh, where I go to visit my fiance pretty often. Um, yeah, that, that pretty much sums me up. Oh, I spend a lot of time on the Dynamo BIM forums too. I guess I should mention that. That's really my, my other home, the one place you always know I'll be, uh, whatever time of year it might be. Thank you, Jacob. Before we begin, begin we got a couple of rules and norms. The lines have been muted to reduce background noise. We do invite you to turn your camera on. This is a community conversation. It's nice to kind of get the feel that we're all in the same room. Um, if you have a question, this is a community conversation, so bring them up. I'll try and spot them in the chat. You can ask them there or use Zoom, raise your hand, and uh, we'll call on you and unmute your, your line. Um, the session is recorded and a link to the recorded session will be emailed to all registered uh, people. So you, you won't miss anything if you have to drop out. And you can also share it later on. These will also be available on the community conversation site. Next, sir. Legal, uh, we, we want you to make your decisions based on products, based on the state they are in today. If, if any statements are made about future functionality or changes, don't make your purchasing or, or decisions based on that information. Do it as the product is today. One thing on that, I am going to be talking about stuff today that is definitely out in Dynamo Sandbox, but may not yet be in your version of Revit or Civil 3D or whatever else you may be using. So uh, keep that in mind, and we'll, we'll try to flag those things as, as they come up. Perfect. Thank you, Jacob. Community conversations provide opportunities for engineers, designers, architects, our artists and makers to meet in a safe live virtual setting to share expertise, get to know leaders in your field and grow your community network. These sessions are always supported by Autodesk community managers to help guide the conversation, feed important uh, insights back to the community, to Autodesk and support applicants and participants in getting connected to the expertise you need. If you're also somebody who has a lot to share, you're a speaker somewhere else, or um, you think you might want to do one of these, this is for the, this is not just Autodesk. This is this is customers, partners, everybody, and we do have uh, a link where you can you can propose a community conversation. All right. all right, all yours. Cool, so uh, welcome everybody. Uh, this is Extending Dynamo. This is the 13th in the series that we're getting uh, going over here, getting everybody up to speed with everything that Dynamo can do. Um, basically, we're gonna talk about Dynamo view extensions this time. Uh, view extensions in terms of what they can do in terms of modifying how Dynamo works. Uh, we're gonna have a little bit of uh, live demonstration on a couple of view extensions that I uh, really like, uh, and then get into uh, question and answer time at the end. So uh, get those questions ready. Uh, feel free to uh, mute yourself or unmute yourself, raise your hand, uh, whatever it may be uh, when the time comes. So what exactly is a view extension? Basically, they're tools to sort of help you produce tools because Dynamo is a tool for building automation tasks, right? Uh, so that fills in the gaps, changes the way Dynamo works, it adds new features and simplifies those tedious tasks. So a lot of times people get into Dynamo, they've got some tedious Revit task that they wanna get into. They wanna remove that task. So they decide let's 
move into Dynamo to sort of automate this piece away. And then they find that they've added this new tedious Dynamo task, such as managing all your inputs or uh, annotating your graphs or whatever it may be. And then they find out they want to remove that. And that's really where view extensions mostly tend to fall in, whether it's figuring out how to take uh, a sort of image sample from all 500 different studies you ran through generative design or figure out a better way to sort of inform users of what's happening in a particular area of the graph or make sure everybody's building to a common standard. Um, that's really what view extensions are there for. So where can you get view extensions? Well, sometimes they're given, sometimes we must go shopping. Uh, so uh, some examples that come with Dynamo. So when you install Dynamo, you get stuff like the workspace references, uh, view extension, the documentation browser uh, view extension. Some of them are going to require a completely separate installer like you have with generative design for Revit. Uh, and others are going to be mostly actually are all going to be distributed through the Dynamo package manager like Monocle, TuneUp, and most of the other ones that we're going to cover today. Uh, so it's important that you kind of know that uh, and know where to go to pick that stuff up. Um, uh, right there out of package manager. Um, before we get into that, let's talk about some of the lesser known settings that happen to be in Dynamo. So you can see I've expanded the settings menu of the library up here. Uh, and I wanted to point out a few particular pieces there. Uh, so five pieces in particular that show run preview. This will highlight in bright orange, every node that's going to be executed on the next run. So if you're curious to know which nodes are going to, am I going to have to wait for to run? If you've made a change to a longer graph and you want to see is everything going to run or is it just this one bit, uh, the show run preview button will quickly isolate that for you. Uh, the render precision will increase or decrease the accuracy of your background geometry display at the cost of speed. The more sort of tessellation it has to do to get that content running, the larger uh, <laughs> the larger the amount of time it's going to take to sort of run that through. Uh, John has a great point in the chat too. The package manager is also a view extension, as is the library, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, number three, uh, we'll isolate your selected geometry. Uh, this will basically ghost any geometry that is produced by a node that is not selected, so you can quickly identify for this piece that I've selected, what is it? Everything else just sort of fades out, uh, which is pretty nice. Uh, number four shows the topologic edges of the solid. And I don't mean that in terms of it's going to display edge geometry. What I mean is if I have a solid, it's going to show the edges on that solid. You can see that's uh, off in that background preview now, but we'll get into this stuff when we get into the demo as well and show this stuff off. Um, and then number five, uh, we'll turn on or off showing the code block line numbers if you want to see those uh, in your code blocks or not uh, by just checking those off right there. And there's obviously some other useful in information here, such as, you know, do you want to disable all your preview bubbles? Do you want to hide iron Python alerts, so on and so forth? But uh, for the most part, for the stuff that I personally think really impacts the way we use Dynamo, it boils down to primarily those five. So let's get into our actual view extensions now, right? So the first one here is our workspace references view extension. Uh, workspace references view ex extension is uh, integrated within the package manager uh, and helps users consume graphs. So if I send somebody a graph or you receive a graph from somebody else and you don't know which packages you need to run it, this will sort of help you uh, get that content. Uh, there are now uh, sort of links in there where you can basically say, yes, I want to install this version, but also flag if you're using a newer version or older version. You can say, ignore that one. Let's just use the version we've got and see if it works uh, or say let's go ahead and get that content uh, right out of uh, off the web. Uh, this does make it so much easier to share graphs and it's one of the biggest pain points for a lot of Dynamo users historically where we don't necessarily know how to get the content that people need uh, out to them in a way where they can really work with that uh, stuff. You don't have to worry quite so much about having a shared drive or, hey, let me zip all the packages I need and I can send them over to you just in case, or you'll need when I get this just in case. Um, so lots of good stuff on, on this front in terms of making things sort of easier to work with, which is one of the core tenants of Dynamo. Uh, after this, we've got our documentation browser. Uh, this is going to give you context specific help. Um, this has been, been included in 2.6 and beyond. Uh, it does provide a framework uh, to sort of help end users solve specific issues that they may not know how to uh, resolve on their own. Uh, what the Dynamo team's done is they've taken the 30 most common warnings and errors uh, sort of compiled from the GitHub issues 
uh, registry as well as the Dynamo BIM form. Uh, put that together in uh, to different HTML pages, which are consumed by this, so that when a warning pops up, like you see right here, you'll be able to click on that and it'll give you the specific description of what that means, as well as some information on how to resolve it. Um, this can also be incorporated into custom nodes. Basically, every package author just has to make a quick, quick little HTML file, distribute that with their package, and then it'll give some information on how to use that particular part. I've seen a lot of uh, sort of the bigger package authors uh, working with that content and building up some really interesting stuff. So I'm really looking forward to uh, seeing what comes from that. Uh, next up, and this is possibly one of my favorites, uh, is tune-up um, because Literally, no matter what you're building, everyone, someone's going to say it should be faster. Uh, it could take something that took you six months to get done, and hey, it's done in five minutes, and someone's going to say, why isn't it done in one minute? Right. So we're always trying to make stuff faster. And pre prior to TuneUp, there wasn't a good way to understand what was slow. Uh, so TuneUp is available through the package manager to install. So this is the first, and actually from here on, everything is going to be installed through the package manager. Uh, this will tell you exactly how long in milliseconds every node on Canvas takes to execute. Uh, as you can see, there are sort of 10 different uh, core features. Uh, you can sort your stuff by execution time. You can sort your stuff by the number uh, of uh, the node sort of order that that node executed in or by name. Uh, clicking on any individual node name will bring you to that node on Canvas, which is also great. So you can sort of go to the spot that's slow as opposed to just saying, this node somewhere in my graph is slow. I don't know where it is, uh, which so clicking uh, is definitely a huge help. Um, and it also gives you the total runtime. Now note that if you run the graph repeatedly, you may get different results because computers are weird. They're not always going to process things in the same time frame. Sometimes they're usually they're pretty consistent, but sometimes you'll get an outlier. So to ensure that you're sort of getting a good sample they've included that button number one, which is the force re-execute button, which will take the entire graph uh, and basically make that rerun, uh, which can be extremely useful. Next up, we've got our Iron Python extension, and this is for bringing back an old friend. So as we may be aware, Dynamo historically has leveraged Iron Python 2.7, or sorry, Iron Python implementation of Python 2.7 in order to do all of its Python work. Um, Eventually, that's not going to be shipped with Dynamo anymore. And the reason being is 2. Uh, Python 2.7 is no longer supported by the Python Foundation. It means there could be some security exploits that might come up down the line, and it's not going to be patched. Nobody's going to go back and fix this, this uh, code. So we had to make sure that you guys had a way to get out of that situation without breaking stuff while still being able to execute that older code. So. Starting in Dynamo 2.7, we introduced Python, uh, Python 3.7 through a CPython implementation, right? Python.net. Uh, and what that means is you now currently in the newer Dynamo builds 2.7 and on will have the option of using Python 3.7 or Python 2.7 to execute your Python nodes. Now there are some code differences and it can be rather time consuming. So you may not want to use that CPython uh, content because while the, there is a migration tool to help you move your content from the old Python method to the new, it can be tedious. People might not know Python. It might be asking you to do stuff that's above and beyond. So to keep making sure that even though you don't have any more of the red, once we get past that future version of Dynamo, I'm not sure which one it, it will be where we won't have uh, Iron Python anymore, we've introduced this Iron Python extension. By putting that uh, extension on there, you'll be able to use Python 2.7 on those older nodes without having to take the time to edit that code. Now, this is a stopgap measure. It's important that if you're relying on that external code, if you've built up a uh, technical debt on having that, that code there within your workflow, that you take the time to edit it uh, to make it work in the, um, in the newer version just to keep yourself safe. Um, but for the stopgap measure, we did put this out there. So it's really important that everybody knows that uh, it's there. All right, now let's segment out of the uh, uh, question from Tom. Can package authors indicate if the nodes are running with Python 3.7? I do not believe there's a tag for that. I think there's a tag for Python, but not necessarily which Python. That's a great question. I'm gonna uh, bring that up to the development team and we'll uh, see if we can uh, get you a better answer uh, next time out. 
Iron Python 3 will not be supported. We've moved over to the C Python. Um, unfortunately, the Iron Python was just a little bit too slow to um, move, which meant we had to move on uh, just because we, we don't want people to be potentially exposed to insecure operating environments. All right, no other questions on that. Once, twice, on we go. So this is getting into community authored packages. Um, this first one is actually from John Pearson, who I think I saw on the line before. So thank you once again, John. Uh, he did a great job presenting Monocle uh, at uh, a couple of weeks back. Uh, we had a, a session on annotating with Dynamo. Uh, I put the link to John's particular section right there uh, in the, uh, the uh, presentation. Uh, so hopefully we can get that uh, link out to you guys, or you can just go back and watch the whole session. Um, I will also note, this is almost always the first package that I install when I'm setting up my own environment. It's just, it's too useful. It does too many things, whether I'm doing just, I wanna play with geometry and just have some fun with computational geometry. And I just wanna be able to change my camera view. We've got that built into Monocle. If I wanna sort of combine uh, with the Combinifier, a whole list of inputs into one uh, list. Uh, John's got that built into the Combinifier uh, monocle as well. If I want to align uh, groups or color my groups or annotate all my custom nodes, whatever it may be, it's all there. So uh, this is absolutely a must install for me uh, in any Dynamo environment. Uh, next up, I uh, wanted to cover Warnamo. So this is one that a lot of uh, people don't necessarily know about. Um, Warnamo basically, uh, it's a view extension from Team Wamsley, uh, who works with, for Autodesk Research, that allows you to launch up Warnamo when your graph runs, any warnings that are produced are gonna show up in that little list inside Warnamo. And when you click on it, it's gonna bring you to that error right, um, or warning. And then you can choose to take action on that or not, whatever that warning may be. Um, this makes it much easier to sort of troubleshoot those graphs if you get one from somebody else. Uh, thank you for posting the link to the previous session. Uh, I think that was Kate. Um, if you get that graph from somebody else and you just need to go back and clean up those warnings before you do something with it or use it in a real project or whatever it may be, this will allow you to do that much more effectively. Uh, there was also a cool feature added uh, about a year back now where you can export the list of all the warnings to a CSV, uh, which can be extremely useful in terms of uh, accessing that, uh, that content and referring back to that content over time. If you're not sure what the problem is, take a record of it and you can come back and deal with it later, uh, which this will allow you to do. Uh, next up, another one from Keen, uh, Keen Walmsley uh, of his blog, I uh, put a link to it there as well. Um, this is Capture Finery. Uh, effectively, what it do, does is it gathers uh, sort of an image of every single result in your Hall of Fame so that you can sort of quickly pull through, build that content up, uh, export it as an image, and then take that image and put together a cool little animation or uh, tie that content into some other uh, piece. Um, so. Uh, really, really, really useful uh, for just sort of combining that stuff. Also has some great tools to basically be able to allow, uh, allow you to expose what that warning might be within the larger context. Um, so if you go through and click into that, you know, run a particular study and that study, you know, errors out, you can then understand why and explore that edge case that produced that warning so that you can get that cleaned up and move on to the next session. Up next is Dynamaps. Um, so where in the world is my GIS data, right? Uh, basically, this allows you to link open GIS data uh, from the open street map data uh, down into Dynamo and create native Dynamo elements, right? So if you wanna know where the roads are, if you wanna know where the buildings are, whatever it may be, you can pull that down and start to manipulate that content, including topography, uh, building outlines, streets, uh, really whatever it might be that you, you wanna to get to. Uh, Mustafa has a great post on dynamobim.org uh, about using this tool. Uh, all the ins and outs uh, that you might wanna get into on that are there. Um, 
hugely useful tool set um, for anybody who's doing any kind of schematic stuff. Um, if you're not sure, you know, polling which, which is the right site I want to explore or if you want to leverage generative, but you don't yet have that full survey, you can get that content there. Uh, also note that because this is platform agnostic, it's not tied to Revit, you can use it within the format integration, you can use it within the uh, Civil 3D, Revit, Sandbox, any environment you might want. So you don't have to build into a specific uh, uh, host application in order to get to this tool, which is really, really cool. Uh, after this, uh, we get into Iris. Um, Iris, it can be a little bit difficult to search for if you use the web package manager because of that. Uh, it's not an R, it's acrylic R, I guess. Um, but it's extremely useful once you get it there. Uh, basically, it allows you to color all your nodes and connectors however you might want. Uh, it's got some great tools that are sort of predefined to allow you to quickly build that content out uh, into a standard. You know, if you want to use a particular color means inputs, another color means just calculations, and another color means outputs or display geometry or whatever it may be, you can quickly build that up there. Even copy uh, settings out to the clipboard and paste them onto the next node. Uh, this makes sort of having a standard uh, method for identifying what those pieces are so much easier. Even uh, you know when we look back at um, uh, generative, or sorry, uh, at using groups to sort of color code our groups and tie stuff together, this sort of takes that to the next level. We can now have a colored input inside a group that means it's doing one thing uh, without having to have a separate uh, pulled out group just for the input, which can be really cool. Um, so more information from that can be found up there on the Dynamo BIM form as well. Uh, next up, we've got Dynamonico. Uh, this is from Andreas Beckman uh, from the Bad Monkeys team. Uh, it has eight core functions to find and fix ungrouped nodes, uh, isolate geometry uh, preview, uh, manage your Dynamo player inputs, uh, go to and open uh, specific graphs out of a library, which is really cool, uh, build a new workspace from a template, uh, package, uh, get your package directories and just navigate directly to them. Uh, search in the workspace and unfancify. Uh, my sort of the biggest pieces for me uh, on that list are create a new Dynamo graph from a template because this means I can put together sort of my standard notes, you know, author and all that stuff, pull that out, put that right into my template. And then every time I want to start a new Dynamo graph, boom, start with my notes already set up. Everybody knows what those uh, group colors mean now because it's already been documented and it helps me maintain that and build to that standard. Um, opening graphs from directories is also really useful. There are other tools for this, but it can definitely uh, filter some stuff down. But by far my favorite piece of this uh, package is the searching workspace. So I can come in, I can type the name of any node I might want uh, in that search and it will pull down exactly where that might be. So you can see he's running it through the animation now, uh, goes ahead and types there. And then all of those ones that are in there, we can quickly pull through individual groups, nodes, uh, or as needed, turning stuff off and on in terms of what we wanna search through to get to the content that we're after. So uh, hugely useful. Uh, package when it comes time for uh, navigating those really big, bulky graphs where you're not sure where stuff's coming from. And then last but not least, we've got Dyna standard. Um, because of course, any AEC technology requires some kind of standard because otherwise users are just going to do their own thing and they're not going to take their time to clean that stuff up. So um, Dyna standard is one of the better uh, tools I've sort seen out there and the fact that it's freely available on package manager makes it really really useful uh, it does take some time you do have to set up that xml file that i'm pointing to up here in the right hand corner say this is where i want to send people from my uh, default template this is where i want to send people from my python template so on and so forth uh, the python template is probably my most favorite piece because i do a lot of work in multiple integrations uh, you can imagine having to copy and paste your standard inputs for Civil 3D versus your standard inputs for Revit versus your standard inputs for Dynamo Sandbox versus Alias versus whatever it may be uh, to really be able to simplify that and get to the content that I want by just saying open a Python node or apply this template to that Python node, hugely useful. Um, Brendan did have a great post on the Dynamo form form uh, that we linked there as well, uh, which will get you uh, sort of all the information you might like about that as well. Uh, all right, so that's everything. And we've been doing a great job posting all those links into chat. Thank you, Kate. Um, 
checking over to see if I missed anything else in the chat before we get into a uh, question from Edita. Uh, maybe getting the name. What about .NET support? Uh, can you expand on what you mean by that? That was a while back too, so I might be jumping into the Wayback Machine. Uh, Colorful does help to find the iris package as well. Thanks, Tom. All right, well, we wait to see uh, if Aditya uh, can type up a little bit more info on what it was they were after on that question. Um, let's pop over into actual Dynamo. Um, so you can see here, I am in Dynamo. I've installed all of those packages. Um, if I come in, or view extensions, if I come over into here, you can see I've got Capture Finery, Dynamaps, everything sort of loaded up, as well as generative design, which I tend to keep on every one that I have. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna open up the built-in graph so we can first go over some of those core settings that I talked about um, and uh, allow us to sort of expand on that. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna hit run on this. This graph is in manual run mode. You can see it's creating just a bunch of crazy shapes, right? Um, and it could be a little bit difficult to identify which node is producing which stuff, even though I can highlight that geometry, if I really wanted to isolate just that content. This is that first piece. We're gonna go up into settings. I'm gonna go into isolate selected geometry. And when I do that, notice all those other pieces that aren't that selected cylinder that I had all get ghosted out, right? We can't see those other pieces. We can see through them. Uh, and really get to understand the shape of the content that I'm producing. And it's not too bad there, but if I had a much bigger set, instead of three, let's say I did 40, I'm gonna go ahead and hit run. And that took a little bit longer to run through, but once it got there, uh, it was you know, pretty successful. And now you can really see if I wanted to look at just the cubes, that really helps me understand exactly where they are because I don't have to worry about those other pieces being in the way. I'm gonna turn that one off. Uh, click back on the background here one more time. So we've cleared that out. And the next piece I wanted to show you guys is showing those edges. Um, oh, good question from uh, Thomas in the chat. Um, what version of Dynamo I'm in at the moment? I believe this is 2.11. We'll just double check that. Yeah, this is 2.11. So this is the Dynamo that uh, isn't built into any of the uh, core products just yet. So it's a little bit forward leaning. Actually, it might be in format. Not sure on that one, but it's not built into uh, Revit or Civil 3D. I know that much. Um, so I can still highlight the content, but you can sort of see how that other content goes uh, in terms of being able to isolate that stuff. The next thing I wanted to show you guys was in settings. I'm going to say show edges. When I do this, it's going to take a minute to sort of render that stuff up. But now you can see I've got the actual edges of each one of those uh, circles sort of displayed as well as on all of, or sorry, the faces of the cylinders sort of outlined. I don't see anything on my uh, spheres because there are no edges on a sphere. Uh, and I only see sort of the bottom of my cones, right? Because there is no edge at the top of the cone, but uh, that's how that content kind of builds out. Um, and it does get a little bit uh, dicey in some cases uh, in terms of you can see the, the smoothing on that isn't great. Uh, we can go in and we can adjust our render precision to get a better uh, run on that. And then I'm going to go ahead and just modify this once more just so we can get this to run one more time. And then we should see some of those lines hopefully start to smooth out. There we go. Uh, so you can see the uh, edges on those circles are much nicer now that I've cranked that up but it does take longer to uh, sort of draw that content. Uh, all right, now from here, uh, we'll turn off show edges. Uh, last two pieces I wanted to go over, or last piece I wanted to go over was uh, show code block line numbers. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and zoom in on a code block. So you can see that is off right now. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and click into settings and we'll turn on that piece. And that puts that extra line in the front there. Um, one, if I go another line, two, if I go another line, whatever you type, it'll give it that line. Now this is a very useful feature because it allows me to quickly get to that content. 
Um, and this does also give me the opportunity to show one of the drawbacks of Iris is it's not gonna highlight your nodes that are in an error state or preview state the way it used to, right? If we think back to way back in maybe the first or second session where we talked about node states, it was a little bit um, uh, difficult in terms of, uh, or sorry, it showed off you know, the bluish gray for nodes that had the background preview turned off. If a node was frozen, it would get translucent. Well, the nodes are already somewhat translucent as a result of iris. So uh, it can be a little bit uh, discombobulating uh, to some extent uh, to have that on all the time, uh, but it is, does enable some cool features and we're here to talk about those features. So I figured I'd show it. Um, <clears throat> view question from uh, Adita, view extensions slow down Dynamo navigation performance a lot. Are there any tips or minimum hardware requirements? I haven't had view extensions really slow down Dynamo navigation. Um, I know with, uh, are you referring to background geometry preview or are you talking about uh, navigating the library or navigating um, the workspace? Feel free to, if you wanna come off mute, you can do that uh, or you can type it up in chat. Overall performance, yeah, I haven't seen any, uh, any kind of an impact in overall performance in my work with when I've had view extensions. Some do take longer or have more impact than others because they'd have more compute. Uh, case in point, I didn't include it in this because it's big enough that it probably deserves its own session, but uh, DynaShape, uh, the physics engine uh, that allows direct geometry manipulation uh, for Dynamo, uh, does take a lot of compute power, right? And that's going to uh, push some, some speed. Um, the other piece as Thomas, Thomas mentioned in the chat there, um, if you're using an older version or an unsupported version of the uh, view extension, it might not work as well in the newer build, um, but with modernized versions, everything that I've got on here right now hasn't really impacted much uh, beyond initial open time. Uh, and that's mostly around Iris. Um, all right, so we went over all the settings. Let's start to get into the view extension. So I said I wanted to talk about, uh, oh, there was one other setting that I didn't get to show yet. Uh, I wanna show the run preview as the last piece. So I've turned that on, right, up in our settings. You can see it up there. Um, and when I hit run, nothing's gonna happen because everything's already run, right? The run's completed, I haven't made any changes. But if I come and I make a change to one of these number sliders, So notice all the numbers, all the nodes now have that orange highlight. Uh, with Iris on, it sort of overrides the uh, colors of the connectors. So we don't get the connectors highlighted, but without Iris, we would see the connectors highlighted as well. Um, this lets me know real quick, because I changed this, every node that's dependent on this is gonna re-execute, but the nodes that aren't dependent on this are not going to re-execute. Um, this is a great way to sort of understand what is gonna happen when I hit run. So when I do this, all of those nodes that were highlighted orange were re-executed. If I come back and I make that change somewhere else, if I change this from an 11 to a five, notice this is yellow, this is yellow, all or orange highlighted, orange highlighted, orange highlighted, but only up in this section, right? Because it's only the stuff that's dependent on this. So I'm gonna run that. Those are the nodes that re-execute. If I was to change this value from 10 to 15, this is gonna to have to re-execute, obviously the one I changed and the one downstream. So anything that's dependent on the data of this gets the orange highlight and we'll see that node re-execute and that changes the location of the spheres accordingly. Everything's a little bit bigger, right? Um, so there you have it. I'm gonna go ahead and turn that off. And then we're gonna get into our view extensions. Uh, the first one I wanted to show off is TuneUp. So I'm gonna click up a new view and launch TuneUp. Uh, when I do that, mostly you're gonna see it launch directly like this, uh, but I did uh, previously pull this out. And this is a handy little button right here. You can pull your uh, view extensions out of the view extension uh, pane over on the right there, uh, and then put it, resize it, put it where you want. If we close it and reopen it, it's gonna pop up right back where it was. Right. Now within TuneUp, there are a few pieces to know about. Uh, the first, again, it shows us the execution time, the name of the node, and what order it was executed on. Uh, so if I go ahead and hit force re-execute, it's going to re-execute 
all of the nodes. You can see I've got 98 nodes in this graph and it lists the order in which they came through. I'm gonna go ahead and redock this since it's not letting me scroll all the way down. Uh, order in which they executed is listed here. We can resort by that order so it goes first to last if we want. The name listed here and then the node. So if I wanted to adjust piece or the execution time, if I wanted to adjust the pieces which were slow or isolate those pieces, we can sort by execution time, clicking here, that's reverse order, let's go forward order. And then we can see the slowest nodes are the cuboid by points. When I click on it, it's highlighted that node. You can see it uh, there. Sorry, that was cylinder by points. Cuboid by points right there. Or cone by points. Those are the three solid, uh, three slowest. Um, beyond that, things are pretty quick. We're looking at 20 milliseconds or less. And even those nodes that I talked about were, weren't too big. Um, it also groups stuff by what was executed on my current run, what was executed on my previous run as well. So if I make another change, just like I did before to this node, and then I hit run, executed on previous run is all listed here, and then executed on the current run, plus the order in which they were executed in, right? So you can see that content all happening here, uh, which is pretty useful. Sorting by uh, execution time, it does break that down. This is on my current run, so just these nodes took 71 seconds to run. Uh, the rest of these, every other node that executed on the previous run took 470 seconds. Uh, Items that are shown with an asterisk, that's actually a multiplication node. That's the name of the node. Items that are shown with a dash is a subtraction node. Uh, that caught me a little bit off guard as well when I uh, put this demo together for you guys last night. It was um, a bit of a shock, like, wait, what? It's, it's a catch-all character. It's a wild card. Why am I seeing a wild card? Uh, so that goes over tune-up pretty well. Um, the other one I wanted to uh, show off was the documentation browser. So I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna make a warning. I'm gonna change the number 10 to the letter A and we'll re-execute this. So that's giving me a bunch of nulls. That's not the one I wanted. Let's try this one. That's also giving me nulls. There we go. Now I've got some, some warnings. Uh, so when I look at this warning node, when I hover over it, null value cannot be cast to a double. It's a little bit cryptic, but if I click on this read more piece, launches up my documentation browser, describes what that warning is. This warning means that the node you were trying to use is expecting an input of a certain data type that cannot be null. Null means no object, and therefore the node is throwing a warning saying you're trying to input no object into the node, which isn't allowed, right? So pretty clear description, uh, sort of explaining what that problem is. And it gives you also, you know, an, an explanation on how to fix it, caused by other nodes in your graph. Check nodes upstream, okay, so from here, one of these might be a null, and sure enough, there's a bunch of nulls, and this wasn't null, oh, I'm, subtracting a from a number, let's make that a real number, we'll go to 10, right? Uh, oh, here's another one, right? When I go ahead and run this, that should go away. In mind, I had another uh, error in there. Now it should go away, there we go. But I still have this one here. We can click read more and it's gonna be that same moment no message because I'm doing that same thing that I was before. So we'll multiply this by 10 instead to put that piece back together. And there we have it. Um, so again, documentation browser, we're starting to see a lot, like I mentioned before, a lot of package managers for some of those more common packages, uh, really get into what can be done with that to make it so that users have a way to really get to the content they need and use the nodes that they're after uh, in a more uh, useful way. Um, other way to get to that, uh, when we click on, right click on the node and click help, uh, you'll see the specifics for the individual node. Hold up, right? What is the node type? All the information about the node, 
if there was any further information on how to work with that, it would be listed here. I believe this is one of those features, make no purchasing or future features the Dynamo team is working on, make no purchasing decisions. All right, so that covers that. Any questions on that stuff before we jump into the next one I wanted to show off, which was Iris. Getting done in the last 18 minutes, so. Nothing yet, all right. Um, so to leverage Iris once it's been installed, uh, when you go over any particular node, uh, you've got this little change in the display right there. Uh, and what we can do with that, we can click on that and then choose a color. Now note, the color wheel is parametric. So if we wanted not 24 colors, but six, uh, we could reduce that way back down. And then this will allow us to pick a color format. So in this case, I could pick purple. And then when I'm done, I hit OK. And that node and all the wires coming from it are now going to show us purple. Right? We can do this for multiple nodes at once, too. So if I was to grab all of these nodes and say, let's make everything purple, takes a minute. I'm locked up. But Dynamo's thinking during that phase. And now all of those nodes are now purple. So I mentioned before, this is a really handy tool to be able to quickly set stuff up uh, so that you've got a workable standard that really makes some sense in terms of when I look at it. I know if it's orange, that's my geometry display. If it's purple, that's my uh, standard calculations. Actually, I typically use purple for my inputs. I did this in backwards order. Um, let's set this to green for now. That would be my inputs, and now purple is my standard calculations. So even though I can't even really see this content, I don't know what those nodes are, I can very quickly identify what they might be from. Uh, if at any point, however, you delete this node from Canvas, all your coloring goes away, it goes back to default. And that is the uh, sort of widget that controls all of the rest. Um, so again, super useful tool, uh, really, really great. Um, and it does persist. I'm going to go ahead and close this and I'm going to open uh, a colored version of that graph. One minute. Colored version of the graph. And again, takes a minute to color all those nodes, but once it's there, you can see everything's received its actual color uh, the way I'd sort of saved it. So I didn't apply a color to all those, but I did set these as green and those other ones as purple in advance. So really, really useful stuff for allowing users to quickly navigate the, the deck, the graphs workspace. I'm gonna close this without saving. Um, next up, I wanted to go over, we're gonna start a new graph and I'm gonna, place a Python script on the canvas. Uh, so you can see here, this is a Python 2 node. Uh, if I double click on it, it does open my editor. I could switch it out to Python 3 or Python 2. Um, but the piece I wanted to show you was this particular content up at the top here, right? This is my standard stuff that comes out of the box with the Dynamo Python template. If I wanna change that in Dyna standard, we've got our Python template center. So all we have to do is highlight that node, click Python template, it pops up this handy window, and we can choose to uh, apply only the selected nodes. And now that is my in the entirety of my Revit Python template. So if I'd set this up, I'd be able to uh, move that uh, content from you know a standard Revit piece, or maybe I want to work with Revit families in the background, so I need different content loaded up or documents in the background or whatever it may be uh, to pull over those key bits of code that I might want to work with uh, as desired. So it's a great way to sort of manage that content. Uh, yes, Thomas, there is uh, an Easter egg in Iris. I can't remember it either. I know John uh, Pearson has some in Monocle as well. Uh, view extensions are a great way to sort of add those, those special, um, you know, fun bits, uh, case in point in Monocle, I know um, the package usage dog, uh, this icon or the image will change. Um, it's the Konami code, 
in iris or in monocle? Let me see if I can remember that. Uh, up, down, left, right, right, left, up. Uh, I can never remember this. Monocle. Up, down, left, right, right, left, B, A, B, A. Yeah, I, I can't remember the code. Hopefully, uh, maybe, if, I don't know if John's here still uh, and he could give me the, the heads up or if he wanted to uh, unmute himself and let us know, but I do know it's in there somewhere. Uh, I, I saw him demo that on Twitter once. Up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, BA. All right, let's try this once more. Up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, BA. There it is, the barrel roll. <laughs> Thank you, Minnow. Um, and John, yeah, uh, everybody remembers the Konami code except for me. <laughs> Triple right click. Do I have to have the uh, on the settings node? Not seeing it yet. On the settings node, triple right click. On the about. Well, it's in there somewhere. If anybody finds it, post it up to the uh, community conversations piece and we'll, uh, we'll play around with it. Uh, because it is really cool. But this is a, you know, we've mentioned a few times in this series, um, you know, Dynamo has three goals, right? Um, make everything sort of simple for everybody to use, um, provide a computational community where people can help each other out. And I think view extensions are really a key piece to that um, and enable users at every level ability. And view extensions also do that really well too. So um, really useful stuff. All right, uh, any other questions before we start our wrap up? I can see we're into the 10 minute mark. Um, Joanne had a, a question. If you share a graph with Iris and they share it to someone else, will they see those colors? Yes, the custom colors will be applied to the nodes as long as a, iris is installed, and B, that settings node does not disappear. Uh, Got to keep that setting node on there, and it should continue to work. I think that's everything from the chat right now. You're fast. I thought I was going to have to jump in because Saul's gone, and <laughs> I, I didn't even get a chance to go, excuse <laughs> me, Jacob, there's a question pending. I. I do this a lot. <laughs> yes, yes, you do. I was half tempted to throw in my own uh, on the on the uh, the Easter egg and just say, "Oh no, you got to click twice and then move your mouse around just to see if you would do it." I would have. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, cool. All right, so uh, keep the questions coming. We've got a few minutes left, uh, so if any last minute questions, put them in. But I wanted to cover. Uh, the next session. So Seoul will be back on the 15th, so two weeks from today, where we're going to start peeling back in, uh, the, the many layers of Dynamo and look at what's way down under the hood um, in terms of stuff underneath, how to sort of configure Dynamo to do different things. Uh, we'll, I may talk about how you can sort of reconfigure your uh, background preview colors and stuff like that, uh, because that there is not a view extension to that as far as I'm aware. Um, and you can get some really nice stuff, but if you wanna do like black backgrounds and stuff like that. Uh, so we'll talk about that on the 15th. Uh, and then on the 29th, we've got dinner with friends. Um, and we're hoping to have some special guests at that 
uh, particular session um, where we're going to talk about how to share your content and make sure it works in content like Dynamo Player and stuff like that. Then at, when we get into August, we're going to take a bit of a break. Um, we've had these going every two weeks for a while, uh, and everybody just needs some downtime for their summer vacations and uh, keep up with the other work and come back again in September for a really strong push uh, up into AU. Uh, where we'll take another week break, I think it is, uh, just because of the way stuff works out. So people can go to AU sessions and then uh, jump back into it and hopefully finish out all the stuff we have. In the meantime, if you do have stuff you'd like to talk about, I know we mentioned this before, uh, please go ahead and uh, propose stuff. Uh, get engaged with us on the community, reach out via Twitter or to the Dynamo BIM forum, uh, and uh, we'll see if we can get some stuff uh, on the calendar. If you'd like to speak, we'd love that to happen as well. All right, on to you, Sean. Oh, thank you, Jacob. Uh, what an awesome session. It was, uh, you know, learned a lot, again, as usual. Um, anyway, um, let's wrap up with two final slides. If you're looking for other ways to connect and engage in the Autodesk community, we have a couple of resources for you. You can explore the various Autodesk communities, including the global network of user groups in the Autodesk group network our industry-focused communities, helping you, your colleagues, uh, solve uh, business challenges together, the Autodesk forums, of course, and staying connected to us on Twitter. And before you go, thank you again for attending. Everybody attended here live with us, as well as those that are watching the recording. These are our community conversations. We welcome your feedback about your experience today, and we will post a session survey or no, we will email the survey to you soon, along with the recording. So continue to stay connected to the Autodesk community, and we hope to see you again next time. So make sure to subscribe to the next Dynamo sessions. Thank you.